Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you viewers joining this virtual session brought to you by the Standard Bank Business and Commercial Clients Division. My name is Lerat Mbele and it is my greatest pleasure to be your host as I guide today's interesting conversation that shines the spotlight on trade in Africa. Now we have an impressive lineup of key speakers for you ready to share their valuable insights when it comes to the issue of trade and the reason we're focusing on trade is because today marks the official launch of the Africa Trade Barometer proudly brought to you by Standard Bank Business and Commercial Clients. Now, this is an interactive live event, so please feel free to use the chat function to submit any questions or comments you may have. And we have dedicated some time to answer as many of your questions as is possible. We're going to do that at the end of the session. But without further ado, let's kick off now with Standard Bank's Chief Executive for Business and Commercial Clients, Bill Blackie. As a bank operating across 21 African markets and deeply committed to Africa's growth, it's incumbent on us to share the insights and views afforded by our uniquely privileged position. Standard Bank's Business and Commercial Clients Division is dedicated to supporting the emergence and growth of businesses in 15 African markets. Central to driving business growth in Africa is trade. We also know how difficult it is for businesses and entrepreneurs to source reliable data and insight on African markets and economies. Building an easily accessible platform to share our unique African insights more broadly has taken considerable investment of time, resources and energy by many people and teams. Hence, it's with great pride that we today launched the first edition of Standard Bank's African Trade Barometer. The African Trade Barometer will focus initially on 10 of Africa's most active trade markets, sharing comparative data on trade openness, access to finance, macroeconomic stability, infrastructure, foreign trade, governance, economy and trade finance. Qualitative and quantitative intelligence currently gathered from 2,400 SMEs, large family businesses, corporates and multinationals across all 10 focus economies, is enriched by third-party sources, including the World Bank, International Trade Center, and the central banks of our initial 10 focus markets. As an African bank, we know how critical accurate data and insight sourced on the ground across the continent has been to our growth, as well as our ability to support our clients' growth. We believe the African Trade Barometer will become an important tool enabling business to identify and unlock opportunity and drive growth across the continent. While East and West Africa are growing rapidly, current geopolitical volatility is highlighting the importance of cross-border and regional African trade. Trade offers Africa the opportunity to offset supply chain shocks while managing the worst effects of inflation, high interest rates, and runaway currency depreciation. Currently, food inflation in Africa, as well as outright shortages of especially wheat highlight the urgency of African government's speedy implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement Protocols. Building the domestic resilience and regional coordination to collectively manage current challenges calls for much closer economic cooperation across the continent. Since the key to understanding and leveraging trade to build more resilience is insight, our African Trade Barometer couldn't be launching at a better time. The African Trade Barometer will present one of the most comprehensive views of actual trade as experienced on the ground by real African businesses. Trends and analysis gleaned will also provide a view of the broader regions and the 10 study markets represented, helping Africa's entrepreneurs to leverage Africa's $70 billion annual trade opportunity. Aiming at two editions a year, we expect the African Trade Barometer to become the leading index of African trade trends and developments. As an invaluable resource for business people, students, governments, NGOs and investors, considering the continent, we expect the barometer to play a critical role defining and enabling Africa's next stage of domestic growth 
and regional and global expansion. Thank you. And of course, Bill Blackie there reminding us why data is king. It allows businesses to plan and to understand the material opportunities that exist as trade starts to open up markets on the African continent. So thank you very much to Bill for those opening remarks and for setting the scene for us here today on Standard Bank's inaugural Africa Trade Barometer and the role it's set to play in becoming Africa's leading trade index, helping role players better understand the lay of the land in the African trade environment by providing that robust data analysis and great insights too. Next, we hear from our keynote speaker who joins us all the way from Washington, DC. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Albert Zerfek, who is the Chief Economist for the Africa region at the World Bank. Let's cross to him now. Good morning to all of you. My name is Albert Zerfek. I'm the Chief Economist for Africa at the World Bank. It's not only an honor but also a great pleasure and privilege to be here virtually at the inaugural Standard Bank Africa Trade Barometer launch. I would like to express my gratitude for this unique opportunity to address you today. I will make some remarks on the macroeconomic outlook for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and on the opportunities to measure and harness development opportunities on the continent. So, as you know, the continent of Africa is currently facing multiple challenges with growing uncertainties and high volatility. I call them the three C's crisis. It's conflict, it's climate, and it's COVID. All those combined are certainly dealing a huge blow to Africa's recovery efforts from recession of 2020. So after registering a huge contraction in economic activity of 2% in 2020, the COVID-induced recession, Sub-Saharan Africa is estimated to grow at around 4% in 2021. The economic rebound in 2021 was supported by a recovery in global trade, high commodity prices, and the lifting of coronavirus restrictions. The upturn in economic activity was maintained by the service sector while weather conditions favored agriculture from the production side. Sub-Saharan Africa, however, is still struggling to pick up momentum. Growth in, in the region is expected to decelerate to 3.6% in 2022. So for those who are asking, how's the continent doing? I would start by saying, Sub-Saharan Africa is neither rising nor collapsing. It is recovering. It's recovering slowly and growth is just decelerating. And I know this is important because since the Ukraine crisis, number of analysts have made it look like the whole economy of Sub-Saharan Africa was collapsing. No, actually it's not. It's decelerating. It's just that, as you can see on this root square uh, uh, recovery chart, recovery is just slowing down. But it's clear also to, yeah, and, it, and we must admit, that the continent is struggling to pick up momentum. Growth in the region, again, would only be around 3.6%, and a wide range of factors are holding back the recovery. This would include a slowdown in global economic activity, global inflation, continued supply constraints, high domestic inflation, 
rising financial risk due to high and vulnerable debt level and climatic shocks. The war in Ukraine is certainly having an impact on sub-Saharan African economies, essentially through a series of direct and indirect channels, including foreign trade linkages, commodity prices, and in this factor may actually be a positive one, but the negative shock on food prices, fuel prices, and of course leading to high headline inflation. The tightening of global financing condition is another risk that we are seeing, and reduced foreign financing flows to the region may add up to the challenge. Given the sources of growth in the region and the nature of global linkages with Russia and Ukraine, the war on the war, the crisis in Ukraine may actually have a marginal impact on growth in the short term. And the impact on poverty may also be quite subdued uh, as the war will essentially and, and rising inflation would essentially affect poor people and vulnerable, vulnerable people living in urban areas. So the biggest risk we see from this crisis may rather be in terms of civil strife as urban population really struggle to cope with rising prices. And this is not food, it's not just food alone, it's energy, but increasingly, it's going to be on construction material. So that certainly may fuel uh, more tension in uh, urban areas where civil strife may actually be tested. Now, the scaring effects induced by COVID-19 combined with climate-related issues do present the long-term risk to our macro outlook more than the Ukraine crisis. And the constraints are certainly, uh, you know, these constraints would certainly prevent the region from really making a dent on poverty reduction and really uh, preventing the continent from boosting prosperity. So the effect of COVID-19, and, and, and again, the crisis is not over yet, the COVID crisis is not over yet. But the most damning part of the COVID-19 is going to be on human capital. As we see potential losses to years of education and the quality of schooling, and this could definitely uh, really uh, you know, harm growth prospect as most of the kids, some of the kids uh, that drop out because of COVID are not returning to school. So this perfect storm that we are seeing, this combination of the three C's crisis is actually unprecedented. But it is also the case that with this crisis will come opportunities. And the opportunity here is going to be in terms of rising commodity prices that or not, it's not just the grains, it's not just cereals price that are increasing. Extractive prices has actually reached all time high during this crisis. And this certainly presents an opportunity for African countries, provided that we manage this order boom better than we did for the previous one. Now, let me switch to really, you know, one big challenge that I do see, because personally, I think beyond the short term crisis, beyond the short term, uh, you know, the short term shocks that Africa is experiencing, the biggest constraint to our future is actually economic transformation. The biggest challenge is economic transformation for jobs. And I want to invite you to you know, focus your efforts in better understanding what will lead
to economic transformation, but the kind of economic transformation that leads to productive jobs creation. And I would also challenge Standard Bank to make an effort to measure those factors driving economic transformation. Trade is just part of it. But I want to call on you, I want to be really ensure that we agree that the biggest constraint, the biggest challenge, and the single one we should be, fo we should be focusing on is actually jobs, jobs, and jobs. And to achieve that economic transformation, I would suggest that we think of it through three different transformations. But before that, the call I'm making here is that instead of getting lost in all the constraints that are preventing Africa from growing, that we focus on a single challenge, economic transformation and jobs, and then organize all the other constraints as opportunities to achieve job creation, opportunities to transform African economies. And I'll come to that in a minute. But before that, let me share how we could really achieve economic transformation. Yes, it's going to be about investment, but it's also and most importantly going to be about productivity growth, but inclusive productivity growth. Basically, the type of improvement in efficiency that actually save jobs. For that to happen, we need to have three transformation in Africa. The first is the technological transformation. You know, Africa is the only region in the world where agriculture is still relying on the rain and where productivity has therefore remained extremely low in addition of being threatened by drastic climate change. And we need, therefore, to invest in the technological transformation that would lead our agriculture to be more climate resilient, that will be more mechanized, that will rely less on rain but more on irrigation, that will boost productivity and get the process of economic transformation going. But that will not happen until we change the way we do agriculture in Africa. Subsistence agriculture rent-fed subsistence agriculture is poverty. But tra technological transformation is also embracing, fully embracing the digital transformation. And African countries are actually late. Late on access, but also late on affordability, late on quality. Having a Afford in an affordable and reliable internet broadband will be defining the future of jobs in Africa. The second transformation that will be critical is the sectoral transformation. As we invest to transform our agriculture, more people will move out of agriculture into cities, more will move into other sectors of the economy, especially in manufacturing and services, if our cities are organized to host them. So the sectoral transformation is going to be about creating the conditions in our cities to ensure that private investment create those manufacturing firms, but that services become more productive as well therefore creating more productive jobs for our population. Sectoral transformation from low productivity agriculture to higher productivity manufacturing and services is what will be creating jobs in Africa and transforming our, uh, our economies. The third transformation is going to be the spatial transformation. Investing in African cities is going to be crucial for economic transformation. Currently, most of our cities are basically just absorbing that excess labor from agriculture into the informal sector that is just slightly more productive than agriculture. And therefore, people are not escaping poverty in a sustainable way. 
our cities are still congested, costly, and not efficiently managed. That would have to be part of the equation to be able to allow our countries to kickstart that economic transformation while creating jobs of the future. So I do see the digital as a huge opportunity. I see uh, cities, urbanization as a huge opportunity for investment and for job creation. I see industrialization and trade, including building regional value chains as huge opportunities for economic transformation and jobs. But the foundation of this framework would have to be one that builds on skills. Skills here, not only the vocational skills, but also advanced skills, research and technology, and the STEM education would have to be emphasized for Africa to create the critical mass that is needed to upgrade its firms, but also move into higher productivity activities. Investment in infrastructure will be key and electricity is going to be paramount because Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region of the world where less than 50% of the population has access to electricity. That cannot continue. This must change. Otherwise, we will not be able to eradicate poverty, we will not be able to create jobs in the region. So investing in infrastructure, especially energy, especially digital, are a huge opportunity for the public, for the private sector, but also for a public-private partnership field that needs to be negotiated very, very carefully, but that could be an opportunity to close the infrastructure gap. Finally, we need to build this framework on a circle of strong institutions. And when I speak of institutions, it's not just about institutions for good governance that are absolutely critical, institutions of restraint, institutions of accountability, institutions that would lead to lower corruption in our countries, but also macroeconomic institutions, central banks that can actually manage to get countries out of crisis. Ministries of finance that are equipped, ministries of economy that are equipped to actually run counter-cyclical fiscal policies that are needed for our economies to thrive. Those institutions need to be built. And I'm hoping that this project will lead to a better measurement, but also critically put those information in the hands of policymakers because ultimately it's important to measure the data alone will not solve the problem but knowledge that is turned into action so as i close my uh, my talk this morning i just like to remind you that Africa is not collapsing. The Ukraine crisis actually is just exacerbating challenges that we have been facing. And the climate challenges that we have been facing with this increased frequency of, of, of extreme events has predated the Ukraine crisis, has predated the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis has certainly dealt a huge blow to our economies, taking our economy into its first recession in 25 years, in 2020, with our economy contracting by 2%. But the continent is rebounding and recovery is on its way. Recovery is just slowing down because of the Ukraine crisis. And our governments, our private sector, our academics, who you, whom you are, need to work together to implement serious policies, fiscal policies, mark, you know, monetary policies, but more importantly, structural reforms that would lead our economies to overcome the single most important challenge we face, which is economic transformation and job creation. Let's focus 
on measuring elements, components of this framework. A framework based on tree transformation, technological transformation, sectoral transformation, and spatial transformation. Let's all work together to make sure we bring data into the hands of those who need it the most, the policymakers, the civil society, but also people in academia, our students who need it to generate solutions for tomorrow, to generate solutions for their own future. Thank you very much. The three C's there coined by the World Bank Chief Economist for Africa, conflict, COVID, and also climate, throwing curveballs at the international system of finance and trade. Dr. Zerfik there reminding us why it's important to have the data that will help to uh, make policies that affect change. So thank you very much to him for his keynote address and his insights. Joining me in studio now to tell us more about the first ever Africa Trade Barometer is Philip Myberg, who is the head of trade for business and commercial clients at Standard Bank. I almost want to say this is a whoop whoop moment. We Absolutely. needed this data. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's so great to be here. It's good to see you, Lorata. And you know what fascinates me, Philip, is that we knew the African continental free trade area was coming. We knew this is an era of change and recovery in Africa, but we've never had a barometer before. So the question is, why now and why not before? I think the timing is fantastic. Uh, in Standard Bank, we believe that we're there to help drive Africa's growth. We know that trade sits at the heartbeat of, of the African continent. So really to stimulate that growth and do our bit as, as the doc has challenged us, yeah. we have to understand what's happening on the ground with businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. And we think this piece of work really allows us yeah. to do that and the wider stakeholder community. And of course, the doc and Bill Blackie reminding us of two things. The data is king, data and data. Absolutely, absolutely. You got to start your strategy there. You got to start your planning from there. Yeah. Okay, let's find out more about the Africa Trade Barometer. The Trade Barometer is an exhaustive research project initiated by Standard Bank that places our finger on the pulse of trade on the African continent. Covering 10 African economies, the report shares comparative data on trade openness, access to finance, microeconomic stability, infrastructure, foreign trade, governance, economy and trade finance behaviour. Qualitative and quantitative intelligence gathered from 2,500 firms representing the enterprise, commercial and corporate businesses across all 10 economies is augmented and analysed by third-party sources, including the World Bank, International Trade Centre and individual country central banks. The result presents one of the most comprehensive views of actual trade as experienced on the ground by real African businesses transacting within and between these 10 markets and also globally. The Trade Barometer serves as a proof point for our ambition to be the leading trade bank on the African continent. All right, a synopsis of the Africa Trade Barometer and what it aims to do. What went into putting the study together and, um, you know, how much work did you have to put in? <laughs> a lot of work and a lot of coffee with that. Yeah. Um, it was a huge collaborative effort. I mean, we were privileged to have the team from Ipsos, a well-respected, mm. uh, long-standing research firm helping us with this program. We had, we partnered with Professor Borat, Professor in Economics from University of Cape Town. Yeah. And then of course, an extensive team from Standard Bank Group all putting their hands into this. And it was an absolutely fantastic exercise and piece of collaboration with the team. All right, so collaboration is key and a huge uh, intellectual investment from some of the most credible institutions uh, coming together to make this Africa trade barometer a reality. So thank you for those insights, Philip. We're going to come back to you in just a short while. But first, now any report of this nature and its magnitude is only as credible as the process that goes into putting it together. So now let's turn to Professor Harun Borat, who is the Professor of Economics and the Director of the Development Policy Research Unit at the University of Cape Town to provide an overview of this report. <music> Thank you. 
All right. Good day, everyone. I'm Harun Borat, Professor of Economics at the University of Cape Town. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have been involved in the Standard Bank Trade Barometer Project, which in my view is an extensive, comprehensive piece of research that tries to understand and identify the challenges and opportunities faced by companies in Sub-Saharan Africa across a 10-country sample as they engage with the global economy and try and grow through the process of cross-border trade. In trying to think through what would be uh, the best manner to build a trade barometer for uh, Standard Bank, um, it was clear that we needed to think through very specific research objectives to define how um, firms uh, in particular and businesses would think about growth and trade in the African context. So the so the so we had a series of research objectives that 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 then underpin the creation of the uh, the index. So the research objectives are varied, but they are also connected, and they include, firstly, understanding the prospects for growth in the country context. So how did countries think about the economic growth opportunities and constraints at the level of the firm? Secondly going to firms and understanding their levels of confidence. What did firms thirdly think about local and global opportunities? Also, what were the core business challenges that individual firms faced in their specific sectors? We also wanted to understand current performance. The two C's in our view were critical, COVID and China in the African context. Determining future business investments is also critical. So what is the decision-making environment for firms and the matrix they use to understand future business investments. One of the core environments within which uh, trade will operate in Sub-Saharan Africa is, of course, the AFCFTA. So the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area Agreement is going to be a critical legislative and overarching policy environment for firms. The question was, really, at a base level, did firms understand AFCFTA carefully enough? Um, many firms in the African context, as we know, face what we call non-tariff barriers, and we wanted to understand what the nature of those tariff barriers were. We also had firms who were clearly um, thinking about global markets. So to what extent was international expansion a key part of the objective function of these firms? In any country context, you need a conducive environment brought to firms by governments as well as the financial institutions um, that they interact with. And so the questions we asked uh, within the research project were what were these uh, areas of support needed by firms from government and uh, financial institutions. Um, many firms engage in different areas and in different sectors, so we wanted to understand more carefully both the sector and the trade products or intersection that these firms operate in. And finally, we did want to get a sense of the geographic spread of firms' export markets as well as the countries that they imported from. So I think across these sort of what were essentially 15 areas uh, that govern the research program, uh, we, we think that built us towards what we would understand as a really important um, threshold point to get a better sense of trade uh, and the environment for trade that firms in Africa operate in. So in order to think in an empirically sophisticated manner about trade in the African context, uh, we came up with the idea of building a tradability index. The idea of a tradability index is to synthesize the extent to which the country could be considered to be highly tradable or not. In order to do so, we, we of course focused on Sub-Saharan Africa and we had 10 countries in the trade barometer that we covered. The 10 countries were both regionally spread and also at different income levels and at different levels of economic growth rate. So the countries we covered were Angola, Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Namibia, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, the United Republic of Tanzania and Zambia. We had both a quantitative component to building the trade index and a qualitative component. And very simply put, the quantitative component involved collecting hard empirical data from reliable sources such as the World Bank, 
the IMF, the International Trade Center, and so on, where we had quality data, of course, and data that would be frequently available, so high-frequency data. Um, that was the quantitative component of building the index. The qualitative component was the use of um, intensive firm surveys. Uh, over 2,400 firms were interviewed across these 10 economies, and in each country, the sample of the firm was stratified by sector, by region, and by standard bank segment. So whether they were an enterprise, commercial, or CIB. So that's really important in terms of verifying our survey data as being representative of the sample of firms in that particular economy. What's key is that because we have a quantitative and a qualitative component, we do need to ensure that the tradability index that we built was contained within a key number of broad thematic categories. We settled on these seven thematic categories and they were essentially trade openness. So the tariff barriers or the lack of those tariff barriers within an economy is an economy easy to trade in terms of movement of goods and services. Access to finance is it easy enough for firms to to borrow. Macroeconomic stability was a third key broad theme. Macro stability means that the economy both needs to be growing and the environment is stable. So you'd have low, in, low interest rates, low stable inflation, and very low levels of foreign exchange volatility. A fourth theme was around infrastructure. It's incredibly difficult to actually uh, conduct trade if ports don't function, if uh, rail and road infrastructure is of a poor quality, if telecommunications prices are really high. So measuring infrastructure as a component of trade is key. We also had a fifth theme, which was a broad-based measure of foreign trade. So what does the measure show in terms of merchandise trade, exports and imports uh, within and across countries? Governance and the economy was key. Obviously, a stable uh, political economy environment with where the rule of law was enforced and so on. And then finally, we did want to understand the trader financial behavior in terms of uh, credit markets uh, that firms operated in with their clients. So in trying to build any kind of index, you usually have different variables that input into the index to derive what we call um, a composite index, where you draw together different indicators to derive one single measure to indicate performance at the country level. Coming out of the tradability index is the possibility of deriving measures that can identify a country's performance um, or a country's shift across different indicators uh, in the sample that we have. So recall, we have 10 countries in our sample, and in each case, we've derived different indices. The index comes from both quantitative and the survey data. So in fact, you can get what we call a quantitative tradability index and the survey tradability index. If you get an understanding of the measure quite clearly, you can also get individual indicator rankings. You could get a ranking for infrastructure across countries, and you could compare that to macroeconomic performance across countries. But you could combine the two and come up with a single index. Or you could combine all seven across the individual indicators and come up with a single tradability index. And so in the data that we have, we provide aggregate tradability index scores. So that's the headline result. And there are rankings, right? So you do get countries that rank at number one and those that rank two are right down to country number 10. So indicatively, South Africa would have an ATI rank of one, Ghana would have an ATI rank of two, and you'd have say Namibia ranked at number seven on the aggregate tradability index score. But what if you said, well, how do countries perform when we only look at the quantitative data? So let's exclude the survey data. And so we provide a QTI, a quantitative tradability index. And there you see, Ghana, for example, is place two, Mozambique is place three. And so you have countries spread across the rankings in a different manner when we only take the quantitative data. If we say, well, let's look at the survey data and based on firms' responses, we derive our tradability index, but this time it's the survey tradability index. What does that data show? Well, it turns out that Mozambique is ranked one, South Africa ranked fifth, and so the survey tradability index provides a different uh, rank ordering. You could also get individual tradability ranks. So you could say, well, let's not combine everything. Let's just look at each individual indicator, whether it's infrastructure, GDP growth, merchandise trade, FDI inflows, 
foreign exchange volatility and then derive a ranking? Well, we've provided two examples here. We've taken a GDP growth rank and a merchandise trade rank. And there again, you can see, for example, on merchandise trade, right? Namibia ranks one. On GDP growth, Uganda ranks first. And so these individual rankings indicate, and this is the critical point, that when one thinks about tradability, there are individual um, factors that all feed into our composite notion of what makes a country highly tradable. One must not run the risk of taking only the aggregate measure because at an individual level in this bar graph, we show very clearly that rankings will differ by the different measure at the country level. If you want to see, if you like, where challenges, opportunities at the country level, I would recommend going into those individual indicators and then get a sense of where challenges and opportunities may lie at the country level. So passionate and enthusiastic in his delivery, Professor Harun Borat, talking to us about how you build an index across 10 markets, four African regions and some of the fastest growing economies on the continent. But uh, we continue. But before we do that, let's check in on the chat and see if there are any comments that are currently coming through. And we see they're coming through. Greetings, Akwaba. Greetings from Ghana. Uh, so excited about the trade barometer. You're warmly welcomed. And as I said, Akwaba. Great to hear from uh, Dr. Zerfek and Professor Borat. Inspirational, absolutely. Kenya is in the house and loving the launch. Jumbo Kenya, na sante sana. And good morning from the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. That's Palo talking to us there. Great insight right there. Super excited from Ola Tunde in Nigeria because, you know, number one. We're looking to you, Nigeria, uh, carrying our hopes along with the Black Stars at this year's uh, World Cup. Thank you all for these comments. Do keep them coming through and your questions too. And remember, the panel will be answering some of your questions later on in the session. So uh, post yours in the chat and I'll facilitate how they are posed. We're now joined in studio by Kudzai Guvi, who's the Senior Research and Insights Lead for the Standard Bank Group. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. It's comprehensive, Kudzai. It's a lot of work. It's unique. It's the first ever. But how did you actually go about doing and conducting the research? Good morning, Lerato. Yeah, so as Professor just alluded, um, so what we did is we conducted uh, 2,515 interviews for the firm-based part of the survey. So in that we had partnered with Ipsos and amongst the surveys we conducted across a range of predetermined turnover bands um, as well as um, sectors, industries, um, together with actual regions across the countries, which was very exciting for us. And in doing so, um, apart from the, uh, doing it across these 10 African countries, what we also ensured that we ensure that the questionnaire was very well laid out. And in doing so, we were able to then combine the data from the firm-based surveys into the trade barometer piece that uh, Professor has just uh, taken us through. So it was quite an exciting uh, part of the exercise. Philip, let's talk about business confidence because the world is coming out of an unprecedented period. You know. Uh, Dr. Zerfik uh, referred to it, the conflict, the COVID and climate change and so many other issues. How has that impacted business confidence and how will it do so going forward? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a two, two and a half years of absolute turbulence. And so we were very interested to see what businesses on the ground yeah. feel about that. We did see them saying that their turnovers had decreased across the board. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, we found quite a lot of them quite optimistic still about the future, which we found interesting. Uh, but yet, you know, a lot of countries, businesses and, and quite a few markets, notably Nigeria, Ghana, said they are quite worried. They're worried about demand. They're worried about operational costs, etc. It has to be noted that we conducted this survey just before the war in Ukraine broke out, and we know that that's having supply chain issue, issues in Africa. And we also know that there's a renewed sort of focus on, on a potential global, global recession that's, that's on the horizon. So I think 
should we do the survey again second half yeah. of this year we might see that change um, but certainly shows the value of, of doing this type of survey twice a year to get a real good sense of what businesses are saying. Okay so we look forward to what's revealed uh, six months from now but what we do know I mean in its simplest form trade means moving goods from one market into another and where Africa really lags is on the infrastructure side infrastructure that supports trade the physical but I guess also the digital now that we're in this 4IR era mm. what does the research tell you about the kind of infrastructure that's needed and what exists infrastructure as we know is absolutely fundamental to to trade and uh, the businesses that we surveyed did recognize that they see infrastructure as, as relatively poor on the continent certainly below average across the board yeah. um, but yet they didn't quite see that as a notable obstacle to trade which we also find quite interesting except for one big exception and that is power a lot of businesses across the continent making reference to the fact that power remains a massive mm -hmm. challenge for them probably the, the, the ones that are most uh, uh, you know gave a lot more focus on it was the likes of Nigeria Tanzania yeah. and even in South Africa we know we've yeah. had power challenges so so very interesting to get that that insight it's unfortunate that power is always sort of the perennial story of what the limitation of the yeah. African continent is but some would say actually that's where the opportunity presents itself so when we're talking energy security to nurture manufacturing industry value add and goods to trade what is the conversation telling you and what is the research telling you around what work is needed and is being done on the energy side? Well, I think we as a bank has got to put up our hand and, and do our bit uh, to, to, to play our role in that. And, and we heard uh, the doc challenging us in that regard too. So we're obviously playing a large role in, in, in financing of infrastructure that's required around creating power, etc. But then we're also stretching ourselves to do more than what's expected from a traditional bank. Mm. A couple of weeks ago, we launched under our Africa China trade solutions umbrella. Yeah. We launched our very first renewable energy import solution where we're helping businesses across 15 markets in Africa gain access to vetted world-class technology out of China and and that really helps them get that capacity into their right. businesses and then specific to South Africa Standard Bank has launched a fantastic offering called Power Pulse which yeah. helps South Africans access a full array of services and equipment that's required to convert into solar solar energy so we're doing both the traditional yeah. and and starting to really do a lot in the non-traditional space to, to play our part in this yes and finding local solutions we do like that you referenced China also just in terms of innovation that you're seeing but China is very much an integral part of the African trade story and figures do show that a lot of uh, trade that African countries do outside of the continent is skewed and favored towards China. There are a few challenges in China at the moment. What bearing is that going to have on the African trade potential? I think we have to be mindful of the challenges in China. I mean, we know that the likes of the Shanghai lockdown that's happened in the recent past and other lockdown challenges related to that has impacted supply chain. So we absolutely have to be mindful of it because what the businesses said to us in the survey was they deeply dependent on China. Mm. At least half of them uh, trade with China, these businesses that we surveyed, yeah. and in the countries that these businesses operate, in at least half of those countries, China is the number one source of imports, and in the rest of the countries, it, it ranks as number two. So we're deeply dependent and, and reliant on China from an import perspective, less so from an export perspective, yeah. interestingly enough, amongst the businesses that we surveyed. Okay, so the China recovery story is very important. That's a macro picture of the world, Kudzai. Let's look at what opportunities exist within Africa. You know, the figures do show that when Africa's trading outside, it contributes two to three percent of global trade. But internally, we're looking at double digits figures, some even say as much as 35 percent. What does your research tell you? Okay, so from our research, what we did find out is the fact that across many of these businesses that we interviewed, the majority of the trade definitely does happen, occur at a regional level. So be it within Southern Africa, Eastern, uh, Eastern Africa or West Africa, um, tends to be quite extensive. But as Philip alluded, the fact that there's high reliance on uh, gross inputs uh, from China. And hence, that's where many of these businesses now, apart from conducting at a very regional level, also expanding across, um, mm. over the, across the Pan-African and um, 
um, Chinese um, region. All right, so the opportunities are opening up. So there is now an institution, Kudzai. It's called the African Continental Free Trade Area. They have a secretariat, it's in Ghana. And that's quite a milestone because when this idea of intra-African trade systems, for lack of a better term, was introduced at a policy level, that was 2018. We're in 2022 now. How far have we moved the needle? I think given its infancy, uh, what you did pick up from the research is that across many of these businesses, there's very limited awareness of the African Free Trade Agreement. So as a result, I think it's part of Standard Bank's um, our responsibility to play a part and hence we are conducting uh, elements such as the Africa Trade Barometer as part of that initiative. Uh, Philip, do you have anything to add to that? Now that there is an actual body, an institution, to bolster trade, mm. how can it be leveraged? Look, we're going to see the impact of AFCFTA stretch over decades because, that, let's be honest, it's going to take decades to really land this thing in its true vision. But we're making uh, strong and, and steady progress. It was officially launched, we know, a year, year and a half ago. Since then, about 80% uh, of the African countries have ratified it. And, and I, I mean, similar to Kutsa, I think the challenges that we're currently seeing in the likes of China, in Ukraine, should provide more impetus to get uh, things going even faster in, in terms of really implementing the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. I want to come back to the topic of China because it's so integral to the story. What does the data tell us in terms of balancing the scales here? Because we've spoken about it being skewed towards China, but what can be done to just tip it in Africa's favour a little bit more? Yeah, it is certainly skewed towards imports, uh, and I think a lot more can be done on the export front. Um, quite interestingly, this, the, the businesses surveyed across the continent did not see China as an export opportunity. Mm. And that's interesting because the size of the businesses are unlike the ones that you typically associate with the export narrative to China, metals, uh, mining, uh, oil, et, et cetera. And, and these types of smaller businesses don't see China mm -hmm. as an opportunity. And, and I'm not surprised. Um, I mean, the, the, the protocols are limited in terms of number of goods that can be exported yeah. to China. And should you actually have a protocol in place, what we found is we've got a capacity challenge in Africa. There's not enough businesses that actually have the capacity to meet the mm -hmm. demand um, that, that China is coming with. So really an interesting dynamic yeah. and, and a lot of it is within our hands uh, to really to really create that capacity to increase our, our export uh, to China. It's a volumes gain. So let's talk about enabling environments and what African governments can do, could say, in terms of supporting pan-African, intra-African trade and a lot of these uh, manufacturers. So what we did find from the research is the fact that when it came to intra-African trade, the majority of these businesses find it extremely difficult. And that's mainly driven by the tariffs, which are quite a challenge to them. And in addition to that, it's also to do with the trade regulations, which they also find difficult, as well as um, customs, uh, naturally. But as Philip also mentioned earlier, um, power, dependent on power, mm. also tends to be quite a stumbling block for them. And governments have limits, obviously, Philip. So what are the strategies for the regulator to do what it needs to do and business to then do what it can do. Mm. So this is really about public-private partnerships. A absolutely. I mean, we've got to do our bit from a private perspective. If you've narrowed down on what the banks should do, we should do our part in creating more infrastructure. We should finance the right projects. We should support the businesses that are looking uh, to grow. I think we've got a big role to play in, in creating a market, helping our helping businesses gain access to new markets, new customers, etc. I mean, interestingly enough, just last month we hosted another virtual matchmaking event connecting around 100 exporting businesses across uh, 10 African markets to foreign buyers, most notably uh, China, just mm -hmm. connecting them to off-takers, mm -hmm. markets that they've never accessed before. So we have to do more of this uh, to really help, help the continent from that perspective. Could I access to information, and I don't mean the Poppy Act here, I'm talking <laughs> people really understanding what opportunities exist around them. Many African businesses will tell you we don't know enough. Um, how can this address that? So I think what we did uh, find from the research is the fact that when it came to accessing information regarding, uh, regarding trade, um, at the moment the reliance is more, uh, more around um, websites, naturally, uh, together with uh, uh, 
uh, television, is coming through social media, uh, also pulls through there, and in, and in some instances uh, print does come through. However, what you also realise is that in as much as differences um, do occur across these countries, when it comes to countries such as Nigeria, for example, there is high reliance on, um, on business uh, colleagues, whether in country or um, out, out of country, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. Yeah, because obviously information helps people understand what new markets exist uh, before them. So let me take this opportunity to say to you, thank you, Philip, thank you, Kudzai. When it comes to sourcing uh, info online, access to reliable and up-to-date information is actually a challenge. So they are addressing this as perfectly as is uh, required um, and other issues as well concerning this first ever Africa trade barometer to help as well as uh, supporting manufacturers. So Kazai, we've been talking about addressing the issue of information. What more can be done? I think one of the initiatives that we as Standard Bank have put in place is the establishment of uh, this Africa Trade Barometer. As a result of that, what we're doing is we're making it available online for free across our various websites. So not only in South Africa, but across the other African right. countries we have conducted this research. All right, gentlemen. Philip and Kudai, again, thanks so much for being uh, with us here in studio today. It's now time for what we say is the Q and A. Now, if you'd like to engage with us, please use the chat function to submit your questions. Listen, if we don't get to address your very specific question, we'll be sending them on to the trade team at Standard Bank for a response. So it will not go amiss. Joining me now to answer your questions are our earlier guests, Philip Myberg, Kudzai Govi from uh, Standard Bank. And we also have Debbie um, she is the client uh, officer from Ipsos South Africa uh, because we also heard that this was a collaboration with you. So, Debbie, thanks so much for coming through. Just your views on the trade barometer. Thanks, Lorata, for having me on board. Um, it's really exciting from our perspective as a researcher where something that we work on so regularly from a data perspective yeah. just ends up as a report. To see it come alive um, and be used in such an interactive, positive manner. Right. So, very exciting to see. Okay, we've spoken a little bit about methodology, just from your side as well. How did you go about um, coming up with the sample? So, the sample is structured across the 10 countries. I think Kudzai and Prof Borat all alluded to it. Um, in Africa, we did interviews with businesses between 200 and 260 interviews per country. They are spread across enterprise, commercial and corporate banking, with the bulk of the sample sitting in the enterprise area, obviously, because that's the bulk of the, the businesses in those countries. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, our respondents are male because they're from a business environment still. Yeah. Um, when we look at it from a regional perspective, spread across the region, so some rural representation, but obviously predominantly mm -hmm. in the in the urban areas. Now, you can understand, Debbie, why this is groundbreaking for those who transact on the ground, the businesses. Yeah. But why is this exciting for you? So I think for us to see the research being used in such a strategic way and having an impact so much further than just for Standard Bank. So it's not something that's only going to benefit Standard Bank. Mm. It benefits the customer base for them, which is the business environment in this, in this case. So the businesses are then going to be able to use the data to benefit their end customers. Because right. as soon as we're able to influence trade, we're able to support the local communities and the population. We're hoping that the influence from a governmental perspective will also be yeah. begin to bring about change, either from an infrastructural perspective right. or from an ability to access products through trade, which makes a difference to the local right. community, yeah. the consumers, not just business. Yeah, it's numbers that are quite tangible. There's a question coming through, Philip, which is, is this truly the first ever of its kind? <laughs> <laughs> we've seen we've seen pockets of, of other environments trying to attempt something like this, but it, it's hugely complex. And and I think with the resources that we have, the footprint that we have, the partnerships that we have, it's allowed us to do it much broader and much more in depth than than I think anyone has has done it before. So, uh, you know, in this, in this shape and form, I think it's the first. 
So I'm going to speak for myself, right? There's a question that's coming through and it says, will we have to pay for this <laughs> research and how often does it come out? And you know, we journalists, we want the research, we don't want to pay for it. <laughs> no, it's, it's absolutely free. Uh, we see it as, a, as an absolute must to have to shape policy, to support the academic environment, to help our customers grow and understand the relative market. Mm -hmm. So it has to be free. Um, mm -hmm. so, so we're really looking forward in, in providing this uh, free of charge and, and the idea is to do this twice, twice a year. Yeah. And if all goes well, we'll we should uh, uh, do so again close to the end of the year. Absolutely, we look forward uh, to it. Kutza, now here's a question, methodology. 10 countries, why those particular 10? What is it about them that would be illustrative of the African condition? I think what we did to do is at the very beginning of the, stu of the study, we did have a discussion with the Philip and team in terms of, okay, given the fact that we are present across quite a number of African countries, which countries should we be putting forward first? So after some discussion, we identified, okay, given our level of activity within the respective uh, countries, we pick at this stage the 10 countries that are mentioned up front by a professor, and over time, we're hoping to be then able to extend it across other African countries. Okay, but th these 10 kind of give you a, a generic picture of really what's going on. Yes. And where that potential is. So, Philip, you've also alluded to the fact that business has a responsibility, and then you've even been specific. Standard Bank has a responsibility. That's when you were speaking to the energy uh, deficit. How else can Standard Bank help? Because one of the things that businesses lament is the red tape issue. It's really hard to just get the right documentation and too many layers upon layers of documentation. Yeah, we certainly have a responsibility in that space too. Uh, we're fortunate that in these markets in which we operate, we're a, we're a well-established, respected brand. Uh, over the years, we've formed great relationships with government, with the regulators, and those relationships should be used to, to engage and, and to, to uh, discuss some of these insights that's coming through from the market. So I think we certainly have a role to play in that space too. There is a question coming through, and I think this is about manufacturing capabilities and this idea of localization, mm. you know, import substitution issues, and what kind of bearing this could have, positive or negative, on uh, industrialization master plans. Looking at the South African example, what would you say? Sure. Uh, so it, access to information, first and foremost, is, is crucial to making any type of decision around this thing. So that's where the barometer tries tries to step in and, and influence uh, that. I think it, through the survey, it becomes clear around where the challenges are, where the opportunities are, and these things should influence how we think about creating capabilities on the domestic front and on the regional front mm -hmm. so that we're less reliant on the outside world, but we work towards diversification of our local economies. Because I'm going to bring you in here and then uh, perhaps, Philip, you can add, which is anecdotally, um, one of our delegates says, I've done trade in Africa and literally says, I've been burnt. Goods didn't arrive on time, very expensive, hard to sort out. And so it's a great idea on paper, but it's highly risky in practice. So the issue is how do you de-risk African trade? I think uh, one of the reasons why we conducted this uh, barometer or study, so to speak, was the fact that we wanted to enlighten an a wide range of stakeholders. So not only across the private sector, but also from a, a public sector perspective, so that we're then able to provide them with such information to be able to identify. So what are some of these um, challenges and difficulties that the various uh, bu uh, business individuals are experiencing, such that they then are able to come up with remedial solutions mm -hmm. to those challenges? Philip? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've got sympathy for that comment. Uh, we've heard it ourselves, lots of businesses having challenges, not just with Africa to be fair, but that's kind of within the nature of, of trade itself. Um, there's a couple of things that, that, that we should look at. The one is um, we should leverage the, the tools that we have and, and, and leverage the tools from the mm -hmm. partners that you have, in this instance, Standard Bank. Mm -hmm. One of the f capabilities that we have that I haven't mentioned before yet is Trade Club, where we uh, connect our customers to each other across borders. I mean, what a wonderful opportunity to connect with a reputable 
business on the other side of the border in which to trade, which should hopefully reduce that risk. And then, of course, there are trade finance products that help with some of these risks in cross-border trade, which we obviously perfectly positioned to help our customers too. Debbie, let's bring you into the conversation because obviously we've been talking to the bankers, the transactors. But let's go back to this research. The first is you built it. You know, you're one of those who built it and thought through the questions that would extract and extrapolate information. What is it that you've also discovered? Perhaps it's not coming through in the barometer, but things for others to, to really consider. And just broadly speaking, how does this research help businesses, policymakers tangibly? I think there's two answers to that that I'd like to give. And the one is just from a straight research perspective where um, typically when you're doing research with businesses, we often have a lot of difficulty getting hold of respondents because they're not that interested in participating always. And in this instance, people were really excited to participate in the interview process, to share their experiences and to share the information that they had. Um, I think predominantly in the hopes of gaining some insights at the end of the day in terms of what's now going to happen with the data that they've shared. Mm. So that was very different. Um, and then I think the other element of it is really looking at the um, obstacles and challenges yeah. that businesses are experiencing. You know, we can find the hard data in terms of what the, the GDP ratios yes. are, in terms of yes. what the real financial, monetary, economic components are. Yeah. But how is that really impacting the business from a use yeah. perspective? What's their real experience? Yeah. yeah. And that um, needs to come through yeah. to something more authentic. We're joined now by Professor uh, Harun Barat from the Development Policy Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. Prof, it's really great to have you. And let me tell you, you gave us a great presentation with so much enthusiasm for numbers. <laughs> 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 we love that about it. Uh, but just from a research perspective as well, what aspect of this report did you find to be the most insightful, revealing? Yeah, so for me, I think what was very revealing was the extent to which um, uh, different components of trade openness and tradeability country level um, feature as constraints or indeed opportunities uh, at the country level. So in some cases, so by that I mean, you know, you may find, for example, that you think of a country in an aggregate level as being particularly challenging, say, with respect to infrastructure. But you may find that, say, in terms of uh, foreign exchange volatility, it's an opportunity uh, because the currency is quite stable. So, f so I think what I found really interesting was how one needs to be so careful about simply putting aggregate one-line uh, views, if you like, on how tradable a particular country is. You do need to go into the details and a little bit of the numbers, yeah. uh, but the output which suggests that, look, you know, in this particular country, infrastructure is a challenge, but um, tariffs are, are particularly low, so there's an opportunity for greater tradability. Uh, in another country, volatility of the foreign exchange uh, uh, may be a, a challenge, but infrastructure could be really good. So I think that for me is the real lesson and the messaging for, uh, for uh, clients and customers looking for tradable countries in this sample. I love the terminology that's emerging. You know, for the longest time we were hearing about projects being bankable. <laughs> now countries must be tradable. And if you're, a if you're a company from a particular country, you must be two things, bankable and tradable. Thank you so much to you for joining us, uh, Professor Borat. Uh, and thank you also to our studio guests. Now let's just remind ourselves of the key elements of this research, the key takeaway for you, Debbie. I think the key takeaway is to see the difference between what we see in the quantitative data and the qualitative data. And that, similar to what Prof said earlier, when you're evaluating a country, is not just to look at the one element, yeah. because we see very different results from each yeah. element. And Kudzai, for you, what would be the thing that must be foremost to mind? I think it's regarding the nuances that exist across the countries. And hence, like Debbie and Professor were saying, we identify that there are definitely differences across the countries when it came to various elements that were used in putting together the Africa Trade Barometer. And Philip, 
we'll give you the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for me, it's just the, the fact that we've created a tool that's so unique here that gives deep insights into an environment where I think we haven't had appropriate insight before at this level. So I think it, my wish is really that the academic environment, the policy makers, and our clients across the continent, the businesses that drive Africa's growth, mm. really take this additional tool that we've provided for free um, <laughs> and, and really help shape the future um, of, of this wonderful African continent, which we love so much. You know, uh, I want to thank you all for your time, but I, I'm really excited about this barometer because I think in a very palpable sense, it says to us that recovery is real. At the beginning of the year, when you heard a lot of transactors and DFIs and governments saying, we're in the era of recovery, it sounded like a slogan, but this actually shows us where that recovery is taking place and what there really is to play for. And so on that note, we come to the end of our virtual launch of the first ever, first ever number one <laughs> Standard Bank Africa Trade Barometer. Let me thank you for taking the time to watch, tune in and thank you all to our esteemed guests for your insights. Now indeed, from myself, uh, Lerato Mbele and the rest of the team, we want to thank you for being with us because you know, with Standard Bank, it can be. <laughs> <laughs>